last lecture, we have given a brief idea about the four fundamental theorems of Norm and Banach species, namely Han Banach theorem, uniform boundedness theorem, cross graph theorem, and open mapping theorem, and a related concepts which will be used in further for a further study of these theorems. Today we will discuss the Han Banach theorem. It is basically an extension theorem for a linear functions. So, Han Banach theorem it is an extension theorem of linear functionals. Now, this theorem gives a guarantee that there are adequate theory of adequate number of linear functional on the norm space or norm space are enriched with the bounded linear function. Hence, the theory of the dual space can be taken up very well and gives you the results which we need for that. Now, normally this extension problem is basically we mean by extension problem. Say suppose z is a subset of x and an object which is defined on z, we wanted to extend this object on the entire x in such a way that the basic property of this object remains intact. Then this problem is called known as the extension problem. In case of the Han Banach theorem, the extension problem is our linear functional. So, where we have the linear functional defined on a subspace z of a vector space x, which satisfy the certain property of boundedness that is which is dominated by a certain function p x which we will define later on as a sublinear function and so on. Now, this linear function which is measured by a certain function p x we wanted to extend it to the entire vector space such that the property of the linearity and majorization remains intact. So, this is what we do in case of the Han Banach theorem. So, basically we say in Han Banach theorem, the object to be extended extended is a linear functionals is a linear functionals f which is defined on a subspace z of a vector space x of a vector space x and has a has a certain boundedness property boundedness property. Now, this boundedness property we will take up in terms of a sublinear functional. Okay. So, we will use the first taking as a uh, definition of the sublinear in terms of the sublinear function in terms of sublinear sub linear functionals. Okay. Sublinear functional. What is the sublinear functional? Let us first introduce the sublinear functional. A sublinear functional
px px is a real valued functional real valued functional is a real valued functional on a vector space x vector space x which is sub additive that is p of x plus y is less than equal to p x plus p y for all x comma y belongs to capital X and positive homogeneous homogeneous that is the meaning is that P of alpha X equal to alpha times P X when alpha is for all alpha greater than equal to 0 in R and x is an elements of x and for x belongs to capital X. So, such a functional P which is sub additive and positive homogeneous is said to be a sublinear functional. Okay? Now, we wanted this functional f to be extended from z to x which satisfy the property that f is linear functional and dominated by or measured by the function p that is f x is less than or equal to p x for all x belonging to z. Okay? Then the Hahn-Banach theorem says that we can extend this functional f to the entire x such that the extended functional f retains the property of linearity as well as majorization. So, this is the crux of the theorem. Okay? So, <coughs> we will see the exact statement of the hahn wenock theorem is this is first we will do it for a vector space for real vector space. In fact, the hahn theorem <coughs> is first introduced by Hahn in 1927 and then later on a, in a modified form by Benach in 1929. So, this is discovered, it is discovered. So, I, I think it's, I will, the hahn theorem, it is discovered by H. Hahn in 1927 and <coughs> in a modified form in by S. Benach in 1929 <coughs> in the form by Benach in 1925. In the then this Hahn Benach theorem it discovered real for the real S for real vector space. And later on it is extended to complex vector space by H F H F Wohen Wohenen blast and so we jike in 1938 okay so we will discuss this han theorem first for the real vector space which is discovered by han and benock 
that is why it is called the Hahn Benak theorem. Okay. The statement of the Hahn Benak theorem is let x be a real vector space, let x be a real vector space. x be a real vector and p a sublinear functional sublinear functional on x further let f be a linear functional let f be a linear functional which is defined on on a subspace z of x z of x of x and satisfied and satisfies the majorization property satisfied f x is less than equal to p x. Now, let it be this is 1, this property we will use as second and this one is third for all x belonging to z, for all x belonging to z, this is third. Okay. Then what this theorem says? Then f has a linear extension. Say f delta from z to x satisfying. the property f delta x is less than equal to p x for all x belonging to capital X. Let it be 3 star that is f delta is a that is f delta is a linear functional. on x and satisfies satisfies three star on x and f delta x equal to f x when x belongs to z for every x belonging to z. So, it is an extension for them. Okay? Clear? So, this is a statement for the real. Now, we will prove this theorem in three steps. In the first step, we will consider a class E of the set of all functional f which are the extension of f that is set of all linear extension of f on e satisfying the condition of majorization and then we will see that a suitable partial order can be introduced which will convert this set e into a partially order set then by applying the rons lemma we can get a maximal elements and that maximal element we will behave we will see that it behaves as our desired function that is it will be linear on the entire x and majorite by p x. So, in the second step we will prove that this f delta which you are getting is a desired function on the entire space x and in between establishing this we need certain auxiliary relation. So, that will we will show in the last step 
that is step 3. So, the proof of this will be divided into 3 steps, step 1. What we do in this? The set E, the set E of all linear extension extensions G of F linear extension G of F satisfying satisfying the condition G x is less than equal to P x on their domain d g can be partially ordered. partially ordered and John's lemma and John's lemma it's a maximum maximal elements f delta of f okay then second step what we do is f delta so obtained is defined on the entire space x and third step we will use an auxiliary relation auxiliary relation which is used in part b used which is used in step 2 okay so the proof of this will we will break up into three steps in the first step we will show the extens existence of f delta and second step we will show this f delta in fact is the entire uh, defined on the entire x and third step a relation is will be proved which is used for establishing the step 2. Okay. So, let us see the first proof of the step 1. So, suppose E be the set of let E be the set of all linear extension. extensions g of f f is a already given to a linear functional defined on z which satisfy the condition the conditions g x is less than or equal to p x for all x belong to the domain of G, for all x belongs to the domain of G. Okay. Now, this E is clearly a non empty set. Why? Because, because F belongs to E why because f is linear and measurized by this and measurized by this okay in the domain of f where x belongs to the domain of f so it is a measurized by this and x belongs to this domain so uh, there exist at least one element f belongs to e so e cannot be e is different from empty set sorry e is different from it cannot be an empty set okay so we can now introduce the partial error on e 
on A, we define we define a partial ordering as follows. G is related to H if H is an extension of G, extension of G, where G and H are where G and H belongs to A. Is the collection of linear functionals? We are taking the two elements of E that is two linear functional. We say that G is related to H if H is an extension of G. That is the meaning of this that H domain of H should cover the domain of G because it is an extension and whenever the X is belonging to the domain of G then H X must be equal to G X for all X for every X belonging to the domain of G. Then we say H is an extension of G. Okay? Now, we claim that this is a partial order set, ordering relation. Why? First is it is a reflexive. Each G is related to itself because G is the extension of G itself. Domain of G is covers G its domain of G covers and this condition is satisfied. So, it is reflexive property satisfied anti symmetric if G is related to H then this condition holds if H is related to G then reverse condition hold that D G is covers D J and both. So, in fact both will be equal. So, domain of G and domain of H will be equal and they will satisfy. So, again anti symmetric and transitive also follow. So, it is a partially ordered set that is we are able to introduce the partial ordering relation on A. Okay? Now, let us consider a chain in A. So, for any chain C in E, chain means a totally ordered set. Totally ordered set means that any two element of this class C are comparable. If we pick up any two element, either one is the uh, extension of the other or vice versa. So, let us take any chain for this. Okay? Now, we define and define and define a new function g hat as by on this chain g hat uh, define g hat uh, by g hat uh, define g hat which belongs to c okay uh, by g hat x equal to g x g x whenever whenever g at x equal to g x okay if x belongs to x belongs to domain of g x belongs to domain of g that is in this chain i am defining the any arbitrary element g dash x you pick up then it will coincide with one of the g x if x belongs to the domain of g okay so whenever the g dash x belongs to it then it is same okay now this g dash clearly a linear functional clearly g dash is a linear functional why it is linear because if i take g dash alpha x plus beta y okay then say alpha x plus beta y then by definition this will be equal to g of alpha x plus beta y for if this point alpha x plus beta y belongs to the domain of g.
is it not? Because it is a vector space. So, if x y belongs to it, then the domain and g is a linear. So, it will be taken as g of this g of y because g is linear. g is linear. Okay. So, we get this thing that is g dash is a linear functional. Okay. The domain of g and the domain and the domain of g head will be the union of all the domain of g where the g belongs to c because when you take the x then x may belongs to the domain of g1 x may belongs to the domain of g2 like this so all are for all g dash x is defined as g1 x g2 x and so on depending on x so domain of g dash will be the union of all the domains of the g head okay the g belongs to c okay where well, g is a uh, element or linear functional in c now obviously this is a obviously domain of g head is a vector space why because domain of g is a vector space g is a linear functional defined on a vector space and this is a chain because c is a chain that is why we can get the unions of this will be a domain okay, is a vector space. Now another point which we claim we claim that that g head in fact is a maximal element of c we claim g head is an upper bound upper bound of c is an upper bound of c why because because like this if we take x is any elements of this because if suppose x i take in the domain of g1 intersection domain of g2 then what happens is that with g1 and g2 belongs to the chain c then according to this i g of x1 equal to g of x2 because it is a common element and since c is a chain c is a chain so this g1 and g2 g1 oh sorry g1 g2 this is not x2 g1 x equal to since c is a chain so they are comparable so either g1 will be less than or equal to g so either g1 is less than or equal to g2 or g2 will be less than or equal to g1 one of them will hold but always g will remain that is is less than or equal to g head because g head will be according to this g head define as g x if x belongs to g so g head will be g 1 x or g head will be g 2 x therefore in all the case g head will be the upper bound for this so this shows the g head it will be this is true for all g belongs to c therefore g head is an upper bound upper bound of c okay so this will be now e we have already established is a partially ordered sort and c is a chain every chain c is an arbitrary chain now every chain has an upper bound so according to the john's lemma it must have its maximal elements because john's lemma so we say since c is a chain in which c is a which has an upper bound has an upper bound and c is c is an arbitrary chain of e 
So, if you take any arbitrary chain C, it will have a upper that is every chain, every totally order set in E has an upper bound. So, by John's lemma, by John's lemma, E has a maximal element. maximal elements maximal element f delta say f delta okay say f delta so what do you mean by this maximal element it means by definition so by definition by the definition of e E is the collection of all the linear functional and f delta is an element measure, so it will also be linear functional okay, and majorized by p. So, by the definition of E, this, this is uh, this means that is f, f delta is a linear extension of f. extension of f which satisfies which satisfies the property that f delta x is less than equal to p x for x belonging to the domain of f delta and let it be 4. Okay? So, we have established the existence of f delta. Now, we will show that this f delta is a lin is in linear on the entire x defined on the entire x so step 2 okay we now show that so if it is defined on the entire x it means the domain of d f bar if it is x then we say it is defined on the entire x okay so we now show to prove the domain of f delta is the entire x okay is all of x suppose this is not true suppose d of f delta is not equal to x that is there exists some point x1 x which is in x but not in real so there exists so we can choose a by 1 a point y1 in x minus domain of f x minus domain that is x or we can also write that is equivalent to x difference domain of f delta domain of f delta okay mm. consider which is in x but not in now consider a subspace subspace y 1 y 1 of x y 1 of x x is spanned by the domain of f delta and y 1 okay domain of f delta that is any element of that is any element of this by 1 can be expressed as the sum of the elements of the dom span dfr plus the element alpha of by 1 type so that is one can write so any x belonging to by 1 by 1 can be written can be written h x is equal to y plus alpha by 1 where the uh, y is an element in the domain of it. Now, one more thing which I mean eh? now here when we say this y 1 belongs eh? clearly this y 1 is not equal to 0. Why it is not equal to 0? Because 
the domain df wall contains 0 and by 1 is a point which is not in domain df wall because 0 is an element belonging to the domain. Domain of a is a vector space and it contains 0 element. So, by 1 will be different from 0. Okay? So, let us take the subspace which is generated by the d f wall and by 1 that is by the spanning of d n wall and the alpha by 1. Okay? This one. Now, we claim that this representation that is is unique. First, we claim that this representation is unique. That is, if we take suppose two representation, suppose that is if x can be written as by plus alpha by 1 and same as say by bar plus beta by 1, we are by and by bar these are the element of the domain f bar and alpha beta is scalar then this implies that by minus y bar is beta minus alpha by 1 but left hand side by minus y bar is a point in domain f bar and right hand side y 1 is not a point in domain of f bar sorry is not a point in yes it is not a point in because it is in outside of y domain of f 1, but 0 is there. So, the only this result holds. So, only possibility is that this by minus y wall should be 0 that is y is equal to y wall. So, the representation is unique. Okay? This shows representation is unique. Uh, once we have this representation, let us introduce the linear functional. So, introduce introduce a functional g one on by one as follows. We are defining the g one on by 1 means the element will be of the form by plus alpha by 1, where y is in dfr and by 1 is a point not in dfr, h the f delta by plus alpha into c, where the by belongs to domain of a bar okay? and c is a real number, c is real number. Then clearly g 1 is linear, because if I take by, because if I take the y 1 uh, say alpha, uh, let it be some like this by is replaced by uh, say replaced by y a by dash by 1 by dash plus b by double dash okay? and then pick up the two element like this then we say because of the f r because f r is linear therefore it will break up into this and get the linearity. Okay? So, g 1 is linear so I need not to show this part okay? see g is linear then further because alpha equal to 0 for alpha equal to 0, g 1 by coincide with f delta by. It means g 1 is a that is this implies that g 1 is a proper extension of a is a proper extension of f delta that is an extension such that that is that is an extension such that d f bar f delta sorry is a proper subset
of is a proper subset of d g 1 d g 1 d g 1 ok. So, this is our domain of f delta and here it is domain of g 1 we say it is a we have seen that this is a proper subset of this. Now, if I prove and g 1 if I prove that g 1 belongs to E by showing ok. So, uh, we if we prove if we prove that this g 1 that g 1 x is dominated by p x for all x belonging to domain of g for all x belonging to the domain of g 1. Then this will show this implies that g 1 is in E because it is an extension ok it is an extension dominated by p by c hence and hence will contradict will contradict the maximality maximality contradicts the maximality of f delta because if f delta is maximum maximum element then a functional which is linear and extension of this cannot be an element of E. Here we have shown that G 1 is an extension of f delta. If I prove that G 1 also satisfy this condition, then G 1 is linear dominated by P a measurite with P x, then obviously the G 1 will be the elements in E, hence it will contradict the maximality of f delta. So, this contradiction is reached because our we reach because our long assumption that d f delta is different from x ok. The contradict the maximality of a f delta and so, so that d f delta is equal to x and that is what we wanted to show that is, is so that d f delta is x means contradiction so contradiction of so that d f delta cannot be x. So, d f our assumption that d f delta is subset of x is is not equal to x is wrong that is d f delta will be equal to x hence this is true hence it will give the in a f delta is a entire defined on the entire x. So, basically we wanted to this part we wanted to show basically this portion ok this is our and this we will prove in the step 3 ok. So, once it is established automatically this gives you the proof of the hard method theorem ok. So, let us see the third part ok. So, let it be this equation is 6 I think this 5 uh, which one is 5 equation uh, g alpha yeah this equation let it be 5 this part is the fifth equation ok and let it be this is 6 equation. So, we will make use of the number that is why we are putting that ok. Uh, so, now let us prove that d 1 x is less than equal to p x. So, what we do is mm, consider the for any by n z. So, consider two elements say by n z in d f delta domain of that delta ok. Then start with this f delta z minus f delta by or f delta y minus f delta z because f delta is a linear f delta is linear. So, why property of linearity 
this can be written f delta by minus z and then because f delta is dominated by the sublinear functional p so it can be written as this because this is the dominated by p dominated by the f delta this is by property by assumption okay that is given in that dominated by this now this side we can write it as p by minus by 1 by plus by 1 minus by 1 minus z and this will be because p is a sublinear functional so we can get the less than or equal to p by plus by 1 and then p minus by 1 minus z okay now transfer this to over there so what we get it real is minus p minus by 1 minus z z minus f delta z is less than equal to p of y plus y 1 minus f delta y minus f delta y ok now y 1 is fixed element ok we are the y 1 is fixed y and z these are the elements of d f delta now left hand side is independent of y right hand side is dependent on independent of z so if i take the supremum value of this side over z and the infimum value of y over y then the result will continue to hold good so we take the supremum of this side supremum of this side left hand side okay left hand side is less than equal to infimum of the right hand side where supremum is taken over z infimum is taken over y so supremum and infimum both are there okay suppose these values are m naught and this is say m1 so there exists a real number c so for osc so there exists some c such that c lies between m naught and m 1 ok is may be equal to also then clear therefore this side 7 this is be 7 equation ok so this 7 so we get from 7 we get from here that minus p minus by 1 minus z minus f delta z is less than equal to c and and c is less than equal to p y plus y 1 minus f delta of y ok this is this is true for all all z belongs to d wall d f wall and this is true for all y belongs to d f wall clear now let it be this 8 a and this is 8b okay this one is 8 this is 8b okay now <laughs> we wanted to establish 6 we wanted to establish this result 6 g1 x is less than equal to px for this okay now g1 x is defined by 5 h this fellow x is by plus x is by plus alpha by 1 so this is x equal to this so we wanted to show 6 so to prove 6 to prove 6 that is that is g 1 x is less than equal to p x for all x belonging to d g bar all x we can write it as our alpha mm, that is x we can use it this one uh, that is g1 x means uh, according to fifth uh, by plus alpha by 1 this is ok this will be the x is less than equal to px that this we can put it for all x this is it not for x this is done so we want in order to prove this thing we will take the 
help of alpha because alpha depends on it. So, to prove this result we take alpha positive and negative both be proof rather than be proof when alpha is taken is positive alpha is taken negative or 0. Okay? So, our proofing of 6 depends on alpha. So, we will choose first alpha to be positive alpha to be negative and alpha equal to 0 then this is that holds good. So, let us take this first alpha is positive or negative. So, choose alpha to be negative. Okay. Take alpha to be negative in 5. Then for in 5, what is the alpha is negative in 5? In 5. 5 means this. Okay. So, we wanted to prove this result when alpha is negative. Okay. So, <laughs> let us replace 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 z by alpha inverse y in 8a when alpha is negative. Okay? So, we get from here 8a, 8a is this problem here, this is 8a. So, here we can replace z by this. So, we what we get it is minus p minus by 1 minus 1 by alpha y minus f delta 1 by alpha y is less than equal to c. Okay? Now, multiply by minus by minus alpha which is positive this gives alpha of p minus by 1 minus 1 by alpha y plus f delta y is less than equal to minus alpha c or this will be equal to what alpha uh, this is cancel so p of p of alpha minus alpha by 1 minus by plus plus uh, is sorry is less than equal to f delta y plus alpha c and this will be equal to x let it be put it x so, this is equal to what p x is it not? So, p x this is p x and this one will be equal to what uh, f delta plus alpha is nothing but minus. Uh, so, what you are getting is sorry this is greater than this will be uh, transferred here. So, it is greater than equal to sorry greater than equal to this side minus alpha is outside and we are getting to be minus alpha p yes minus alpha is outside then we are getting minus alpha into this multiplying by this minus alpha. So, here also is minus alpha times of this. Okay. So, alpha and then transferring towards this side we get the minus and this one will be equal to what g x g 1 x this is greater than equal to what we are getting is here is p alpha y 1 plus y, but this p alpha by 1 plus y is, is our p x. So, we get g 1 x is less than equal to that. Okay? Now, for alpha equal to 0, the result is obvious and for alpha to be positive in a similar way, similar way we can show that g 1 x is less than equal to f delta by plus alpha c which is less than equal to p x. Hence proof. This we can do. Okay? Thank you. Thanks.